Hey Robot Makers, how are you doing? I hope you've had a good day so far. So have you heard about the micro bit? I've got quite a few of them here to show you today. There's one of the original version one micro bits. So we're talking about micro bits today, everything to do with them. So do you know what they are? Do you know how you can use them for robotics? Then this is the right video for you. So I've got, like I said, I've got a lot to show you today, um, to share with you. So let's dive straight in. My name's Kevin McAleer. Come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. So let me get over to my keynote. Right. Oops. I'm not supposed to see that. That's behind the scenes. <laughs> right. Micro bits. So the session goal today is to learn about the micro bit. We want to learn what it is, you know, how does it compare to the Arduino, the Raspberry Pi and the, uh, the Pico um, and, um, and the ESP maybe as well. I've got one of those we can look at too. Um, what can it do? What's the difference between the version one and the version two, the micro bit that was released last October. And let's have a look at some of the add-ons as well. And we'll have a bit of a demonstration, some of the really cool things that you can do with it. And I'd say this is an introduction, so it's a beginner's level. So what is the micro bit? So it's a microcontroller. It's made in the UK. Um, it's 3.3 volts. Um, it has 256K of flash and 16K of RAM. Um, it has a little LED display. So it's got five by five matrix, 25 pixels. And weirdly, they can actually be used to detect light. I didn't know you could do that. But um, if you look into how LEDs work, these are to do with NPMs and PNPs and so on. Anyway, because they're a diode, they can actually detect light as well. So didn't know that. You can actually use them as a very, very poor quality solar panel. But I digress. They also, the the microbits also have two buttons on them. So you have a, an A and a B button. So I've got the A and the B buttons here. And they also have a motion sensor as well. So they've, uh, the newer version has the compass. The older version, I think, just has the accelerometer. Um, so it can detect which orientation it is and you know if it's being shaken and things like that. Um, the old version has radio in it, so you can communicate with them two micro bits that's in, you know, in sort of reasonable proximity to each other. One can send a message to the other. And it doesn't use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth in the original version. It uses um, a sort of low power. I think it's like an FM uh, transmitter. So uh, the newer version does have Bluetooth. So you can connect to the, um, the chip via Bluetooth and load code, or you can just use it as a Bluetooth module to uh, connect to other things as well. The newer version, the version two, has audio as well. So it has a microphone and a speaker. So we'll have a look at some of that in a minute. It's quite fun. And um, it actually has 19 GPIO pins. I mean, when you look at one of these things, you, you're immediately sort of drawn to the to the five pins on the bottom, if I can just get that steady for a second there. So you've got 0, 1, 2, 3, point th th 3 volts and ground. And your eye's kind of drawn to them. But it actually has these smaller ones in between that, so we can actually use them as well, typically with like an edge connector. And cost-wise, they're about... £13.50, I think, when I looked into these. Um, I think educational institutes get them a lot cheaper, and we'll get into that in a minute too. So they are crocodile friendly. So crocodile clips, is that what you call them universally? That's what I know these things are. So I've got a bunch here. Um, what you can do with these things, if I just go to the host view for a second, um, let's just zoom in on that. They've got like a little shield around them, but essentially yeah, it's just like a little mouth and you can grab all the things. And the idea is you can... Apparently this is the correct way to do it. You you put the the crocodile clip like so, so that it can uh, it grabs hold of that um, that particular I/O pin there. So we can do that like so. So I've got two of them things connected, and then you connect these things to some other component on the other side. So that's what we are uh, we are talking about when we talk about crocodile clips. Um, so you can plug these into lots of other um, accessories. I've got a whole bunch of them I can show you in a second on the overhead. Um, but also the, 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 the A and B buttons, they're really fun. So the little, um, you know, contact, is that what you call them? Contact switches. So you press the momentary switch. I think that's what it's called. So it goes down and as soon as you let go, the switch bounces back up again. Uh, and they're marked as A and B. So you can use them as sort of uh, left and right or just A and B buttons. And the newer micro bit, I didn't realize this, but it actually has a touch sensor right in the middle there. So this logo, when I touch that, um, it's gonna fire off a bit of code when I'm running it in a second. Um, 
which we'll get into in the demonstration, but that's actually a touch sensor. So the, the surrounding bit, um, if I sort of show you on the screen here, this sort of round bit here is one part of the sensor and then the, the two dots in between detect the, you know, the circuit being made. So it's not capacitive touch such as it's like a resistive touch. It can detect that the resistance has changed between those points. So the great thing about these micro bits is they're really small. Um, you know, by way of comparison, if I grab, let me see, um, let's grab this Smiles robot here and just show you just comparison wise. So we've got uh, an Arduino shield there and then there's a micro bit sort of next to it. So you can see it's quite, quite a lot smaller. So I thought I'd show you that for way of comparison. And you can connect to the uh, micro bit using um, USB, a micro USB connector. That little white socket to the right is a, is it GST connector, so you can connect a battery to it and have this thing running um, completely on its own. And these edge connectors as well have like a 3.3 um, and ground volt, so you can actually connect other things to them that way to power it. And there is also a dedicated reset button there as well, so you just click that and it'll just reset the button, uh, reset the chip. So we talked about the pinouts before, these 19 I.O. pins. Um, I'll just go slightly larger so you can see what this is. If I press the right button there, yep. So you can see that we have, I'll just turn off that coffee thing for a second. We can see all the different I.O. pins we've got. So if we start down at the very bottom here, the very first pin, so that is, a, is actually a pin there. So that's GP03. That is also the column one of the LEDs and it can also be used for analog input as well. Um, so you can see though, we've got um, three different grounds. The grounds are all marked in black there. They're essentially just this area here. We have uh, an SPI and an I to C bus, an I squared C bus. So the um, I squared C bus is in blue here. It's pins um, GP20 and 19, which is pins 20 and 21, if you're reading it sort of logically from the bottom there. And we've also got the SPI as well, which is uh, these three here. We've then got buttons A and B, so they're actually broken out into some of the pins as well, so you can detect them or you can just uh, feed in other inputs and override the buttons. And we've got those six analog inputs as well for reading analog values. And all 19 can be used as digital in or out as well. So that's not including the ground, obviously. There's 24 pins in total, but 19 I.O. pins. And like I said, the LEDs as well count as an output. So uh, move to the next slide. We can have a a bit of history about where did this micro bit come from. So the micro bit is actually based upon, um, let me just go like that for a second. So it's actually based upon um, the the um, the program that was started in the 1980s um, by the um, you know, British Broadcasting Corporation. They wanted to get um, kids really interested in computing because it was like a real nascent kind of market at the time. Uh, they knew that this would be a really big thing and you know home computers were just taking off. You had things like the ZX Spectrum around 1982. You had, um, you had some of the larger computers like the Apple Mac I have in the background there. That was like around about 1984, 90, uh, sorry, 1984-85 kind of period. But home computers like the Apple II, that you know, they were they were that sort of same kind of era, just early eighties. So um, the BBC wanted to um, wanted to do an educational program about this. They wanted to get children learning how to you know program a computer, um, take that further and integrate it into different things. So they reached out and did um, a bit of a competition. And interesting, there's a there's a TV program not so long ago called Micro Men, and it charts the. Uh, um, the competition that, that came about, there was a guy called Chris Curry who originally worked on the ZX Spectrum and he went and formed, um, is it Cambridge Computing? And um, that then became Acorn Computers as we know it. So um, Acorn are the people who produced the BBC Master Computer, the BBC Micro. Um, I think the Master was a, a, a better version of the original Micro, but the one that I've got there is a BBC Micro. That's my aunties. I'm just pointing across there because it's physically just here. You can see there. Uh, it does work. I switched it on this afternoon and it did the, uh, the sort of beep sound to, to sort of say, yes, I'm alive and I can work. The only thing I haven't done is hook it up to some kind of input so that you can see the screen. But um, I'll, I'll see if I can get that working. It's got like a composite video out so I can I can take that and probably run it through some monitor or something that I can then take a HDMI out, output from and feed it into this so that you can see it. But it is running. 
Uh, and then getting code into it is probably another thing. So these things typically use things like uh, cassette tapes. The BBC did have uh, an option for a disk drive. So a lot of schools would have uh, floppy disks, the sort of five and a quarter inch. Is it five and a half inch or five and a quarter? Anyway, the larger size uh, disks. And, um, you know, you could very quickly load programs onto them with those. So lots of extra add-ons were made for the educational market. I've seen them used in like laboratories and things. And, um, you know, if people want to take a read and do data login, that's a typical kind of thing. Tom informs me it's uh, five and a quarter. Thanks for that, Tom. <laughs> so I always get those mixed up when I'm on the spot. <laughs> Um, so memory wise, you know, these things are quite similar to what we have in the micro bit. So in the micro bit, um, we've got a similar amount of memory and we'll get onto specs in a minute. But um, the original BBC computer had 128K of RAM and it had a two megahertz Rockwell processor. So not, you know, ground shaking. If you think the Arduino is like um, about eight megahertz, 16 megahertz, 16 megahertz, um, it can run slower, I think. But um, it's the crystals at 16. So these are quite a bit slower but they had a vast library of software so all kinds of things from games to educational stuff and a little bit of um you know business software but probably not too much of that um, they were more designed for the home market so lots of games i remember going to like wh smiths which was our uh, local news agent and um they sold all kinds of magazines and things like that. They, have, they started off around train stations, but they, they ended up um, selling lots of computer software. And that's where you'd go and have a look and see what was available, typically on cassette tape. Uh, and there was lots of BBC stuff there, BBC computer stuff. And then there was a TV program as well that was called Micro Live. And it had, um, what was the guy called? Something Harris. Uh, it's not Ed Harris. What was he called? Anyway, um, he was on there. Uh, He's got a famous daughter as well. I'm completely going on a tangent here. <laughs> anyway, there was a program there and it was all very, uh, you know, they're all in suits and stuff and trying to make it kind of trendy and stuff and really not quite understanding what they're talking about. But I remember that specifically being on TV and they're showing all the innovations and things you could do with this. So, um, yeah, check out Micromen. I think somebody might have put it on YouTube, but um, it's probably available on like Netflix or Amazon Prime, something like that as well. Micromen. That's worth checking out. So that was just a bit of a side note about, you know, where is this BBC micro bit come from? Um, and they talked about micros. Microcomputer was a big term they were using back then. And it's kind of lost its meaning now. We talk about a personal computer, but it has a micro processor in it. And the reason it's micro is because processors are really small nowadays. Before that generation, you had like mini computers and you had mainframes. And a mainframe would take up the size of this room that I'm in now, you know, this... If I just go to that shot, this this massive room that I'm in now, that would be taken up entirely by a, by a computer. You know, a circuit board to like memory or something would be the size of like, you know, a, an A2 sheet or something. Vast thing. So scaling these things down, um, talked about very, very, very large scale integration, VLSI. Uh, and that was with things that enable these mini computers and then micro computers to sort of come about. So bit of history there I thought would be relevant to this scene as it's by the same company so a BBC microcomputer there that's the sort of main shot of it and I've got a smars next to it there and a little micro bit just resting against the uh, the tracks there just the way of comparison and size beautiful keyboard on these things I really like the mechanical keyboard it's got like a proper proper click to it um, feels really robust as a computer so the micro bit. Let's get back to that for a second. So a million of these things were given away. Uh, every year seven student in the UK was given one of these um, over a number of years, I think. I don't know if they're still doing this today, but um, from at least 2015, when the first generation came out, um, every kid got one of these. I don't know what they did with them. Probably flung them away. <laughs> I mean, some of the kids are like, what's this all about? Um, but, you know, it's a pretty impressive little computer to uh, to get. And we'll get onto some of the things it can do in a second. But if you go to microbit.org, you can have a look at the foundation there, the Microbit Foundation, and uh, they've got lots of tutorials and guides and videos and stuff. And I've got a level with you. When I when these came out, I bought one, and I immediately put it in my drawer and thought, I'm not really that interested in this. It's got too many bits on it, and I don't really like development boards that have lots of sensors and things on them. I like the processor to just be a processor. And if I want to stick on like a temperature sensor, I'll get one and connect it in. Having one built in, I'm like, nah, not really sure I want that. And it adds to the price and the power usage and all that. So I was never really a big fan of these, but um, I, when the version two came out, 
I got this and had a look at it a bit more in depth and it can do some pretty cool things I've got to say so we'll have a look at that and I'll just go back a second to that for a for a second. One of the things I like about it as well is they come in different colours. So um, if I grab this one here, and we'll have a look at this in a second. This one is one of the yellow varieties. You can see it's got little um, yellow triangles there. And um, which other ones I've got? I've got the green one there and another yellow one there as well. So they all come in different sort of colours. Just I don't, I don't think you can actually say which colour you want. They just, whichever one comes next is what you get. So anyway, so if you like these videos, um, please like, subscribe, comment on the, the video if you're watching on replay. It just helps the channel grow and um, helps more people see the content that I'm producing. Um, and I was, I was looking at lots of things recently about, as a creator, um, should you be asking people to like your videos or to subscribe? Some people like really against this idea, but they tend to have much larger channels. Um, so that's fine for them to say that. Mine's a really small channel. We did hit 600 subscribers this week. So I was like, wow, that's that's a really good milestone to hit. Um, and it's already increased uh, quite a bit since then. So let's keep subscribing. That helps me grow the channel, gets in front of more people and uh, we all get to benefit from that. <laughs> Great stuff. So. That's my bit over with that. So I wanted to talk as well about electronics kits in general. So when I grew up, um, you used to be able to get these um, all-in-one um, kits, science kits, they sometimes call them. Um, so I've mocked one up here in uh, Fusion 360, just because why not? And um, wh what was really cool about these is they had all the little discrete components sort of stuck into a piece of cardboard. The cardboard would have two little springs either side of it, um, if it had like two connectors and you would just bend the, the sort of uh, spring over, shove the wire in, let the spring go back, and that would be the connection. And then you'd connect that to another component. And you could build all kinds of things like FM radios or sound effect things. Um, there was loads of them, and they would try and cram in as many things as possible onto this, you know, quite cheaply made piece of cardboard with springs and components on it. But honestly, hours of fun I had with that, just bending bits of wire and trying to get this thing connected. And it'd have like um, a name like the Leaky tap, leaky faucet. Faucet was a what's a faucet? That's a funny word. Um, probably like an American word. We wouldn't use that in England. We would say tap. But yeah, leaky faucet, and it just made a weird sound effect, like a dripping tap. Um, and you would spend ages, sort of maybe like an hour, wiring this thing up for it to just make some sort of creaky sound. And you think, mm, is that it? But you know, it was great. So I love these. And the more sophisticated ones are like LED displays, like. Um, segmented displays um, some of them had like sort of knobs and twiddles and levers and things on them um, hall effect sensors i remember that being quite cool where you could bring something towards something else and it would detect that that was nearby and the other one was like a was it a reed switch where if you put like a magnet near it it would sort of click shut so there's all kinds of cool things that are on there um, i love these things but i've never really been very good at electronics so this was quite cool because it was a solderless thing. So you would, like I said, just bend the spring over, put the wire in, let go of the spring and you would have your connection there. And these things would last, you know, ages. They were pretty robust. I did have one or two that I, I built where you got the sort of magic smoke and you quickly whipped away the thing because you short circuited something somewhere or put too much current through it. Um, but they were generally designed that that wouldn't happen, that it was quite a safe environment or battery powered, like a nine volt battery or something, or maybe just a couple of AA batteries. Um, and yeah, the instructions for these, you know, you tended to get like a badly photocopied piece of paper as the instructions. And it would just say like 21, 31, 18, 17. And you would have to just put a wire from one thing to the other and then just spend ages wiring these things up. And then at the end, you would get sort of a slightly lackluster result sometimes. Other times it was quite cool. So I like these things. Um, I recently posted on, uh, um, was it the Arduino forum on Facebook about this? And it got like about 500 replies. People sort of saying, oh, I had that one. I had the, the 75 in one or the 150 in one project kits. And uh, they were all by Science Fair and um, Radio Shack. They, they sold a lot of them. So in the UK, uh, the guy who owned Radio Shack, his surname was Tandy. And in the UK, we didn't have Radio Shacks. We had Tandy as our stores. And uh, this is where they had them. So around my birthday, around Christmas, I would go in there and like have a look and see what they had. And they had loads of these. So love these things. And like I said, I think electronics is probably still my weakest area. 
And everyone has a weak area in mm, uh, some I area. I know that one. <laughs> There's my Alexa chipping in there. So yeah, everybody's got skills in some areas and weaknesses in other areas or areas to develop, we would say. So, you know, what the question is, is what are the areas that you are going to develop in? So if I just zoom in on that, is it that one there? There we go. So this is a little diagram I created a while back and I'll zoom into some of these. You can have a look a bit um, in more detail. So in the middle, if we're the robot here, that's where we're sort of working towards. And you've got these maker, engineer and tinkerer kind of skill sets that overlap. The areas of knowledge and um, skills that you need to be good at robotics include design and engineering. So that's all the physical stuff. You've got electronics and you've got programming. And some people have maybe two that they're good at and not a third. So for me, I'm good at programming. I'm good at design and engineering. Not fantastic at electronics. So that's an area I need to sort of improve upon. So can we zoom in on this for a second? So the design and engineering point, um, the skills and knowledge to do with physically making things. So this is where, until I got a 3D printer, I was terrible at this. Um, I would, I'd be good at like sellotaping cardboard together, but not great at drilling wood or anything like that. Um, and it includes things like measuring. So, you know, I've got my, my digital calipers. I use these quite a lot for, um, oops for you know, measuring components and stuff. These are one of my favorite tools. Um, they're not too expensive and you know, they're very accurate for what they are. So I love these digital calipers. Let's just get back to that one for a second. So yeah, measuring, understanding tolerances, and particularly if you're 3D printing parts and designing, that becomes really important. Otherwise everything's like really stiff and doesn't uh, turn nicely. And stresses and pressures. So if you're designing a part and you've just got um, something that's, you know, going out 90 degrees from another part, it'll snap unless you give it some kind of um, struts or webs or something like that. And then different materials. So, you know, not plastic isn't always great. There are different types of plastic. There's ABSs, there's PLAs, there's TPUs, all the different types of materials and when's best to use them. Sticking things together. I remember um, watching um, something on Tested, you know, Adam Savage's show, and he was talking about, you know, gluing things together and adhesion. And he said, there is as many types of glue as there are different types of materials that you want to stick together. There isn't just like one universal glue that you can put that on that and glue them things together. So if you're gluing like plastic to wood, there's a type of glue for that. Wood to wood, there's a specific glue for that. Plastic to plastic, type of glue for that. So always try and figure out what the best type of glue is to adhere two things together and you'll be on the right track. And he said that was something that he took quite a while to sort of understand and get used to. So uh, let me just zoom back in on that. So adhesion something. And then CAD CAM, computer aided design and computer aided manufacturer. And with 3D printers, that's become like a real go-to skill set now. So I recently purchased the full copy of Fusion 360. Love, absolutely love this. I did have some 3D skills, um, 3D design skills. Previous to that, I spent about three years learning Blender. So I knew how to sort of create objects in 3D and the kind of operations you'd need to do that. But I love um, parametric modeling in, in uh, Fusion, it's great. And then just practical knowledge of just, do you know if this thing's generally gonna work? Have you got a gut instinct for this? Um, so building things and, and putting things together. Um, I've always been good-ish at that, but um, not good with, with wood and things like that. Good with, with cardboard, I would say. Then next we've got, um, Electronics. So this is the area where my skills are probably weakest, um, sort of discrete electronics and the theory behind it. Um, so this is everything to do with electronics, you know, power, voltage, current, resistance, capacitance, all that good stuff. Um, building circuits with breadboards and then later printed circuit boards, soldering things together, understanding about flux and, um, you know, solder and how to do soldering. That's definitely a skill in itself. And then all the different types of connectors and plugs and wires that you could possibly use. There are so many different types of connectors and knowing which is the right one for the job um, is, is important too. And then reading circuit diagrams is definitely a skill. Um, there's a, an international standard of circuit boards. And uh, if you can read a circuit diagram that somebody's created and create something from that, um, you know, that's a real skill. So that's the electronics one. And then finally programming. So this is my wheelhouse. I'm good at coding, not professional, but I am good enough. So I can read and write in most languages. Um, and you know, 
choosing the right language for the job is also a, an important skill. So if you're developing a robot, you know, is it best doing this in C, C++ or Python? What's, what reason would you use Python over C, for example? So using the best language for the, for the application in, intended is an important skill. Um, and then software engineering techniques. So, you know, how do you go about writing this code? Is it all procedural code? Is it classes? Um, how you, are you looking at uh, patterns, um, factories, all that kind of good stuff that you come across in software engineering? And then how do you share that code and save it and control it and have version control over it? So source code control and testing are some good skills there that you need to develop. And in general, whichever language you choose for programming, it's that solving mindset. So how do you look at a problem, break it down and then figure it out? Uh, I was watching some videos this morning about mathematical problems. Like if you've got um, three tangentially touching circles, how do you figure out, you know, what the, the distance is between them? And this guy went through sort of breaking the problem down. And as I was watching it, I, I was two or three steps ahead. And I'm, I'm rubbish at maths. You know, I, I wouldn't say I was great at that, but I'm good at programming. So I'm good at algorithmic thinking. And maths and algorithmic thinking are hand in hand. So very similar. So one of the final skills I would say for programming is, is, is finding other people's code on the internet, bringing it into your project and just making the whole thing stitch together, just work properly. So that isn't always straightforward. And I spend most of my time trying to figure out and hack other people's code to, to get it to work um, for me. So that's one of the, the, the skills there. So I hope this skills finder is of interest to you. Um, yeah, happy for people to sort of take that and use that as they want and build to it. It's quite bare. We could add a lot of things to that, lots of languages. Somebody was talking about Rust the other week and using that. So I had a quick look at that. It looks quite C-like. So how does our microbit compare to the Arduino and the Pico? So we've got a little table here we can look through. And the microbit, there's two versions of it. So um, there's only one version of the Pico. There are many versions of the Arduino. So when I'm talking about the Arduino, I'm talking about the Arduino Uno version 3. So the Arduino has 2K of RAM, that sort of working memory. Um, the Pico has 264, so it's got loads. Um, the Microbit has 16, so it's got more than the Arduino, not as much as the Pico. But then the version 2 has got um, quite a bit more there. It's got 128, so quite a lot of, uh, of RAM there. And then flash, which is kind of like the hard drive, it's the, the permanent storage on the, the chip. Um, so the Arduino has 32, the uh, Pico has 2 meg, it's got absolute loads. The original microbit's got 256, whereas the version 2 has got twice that, it's got 512k of onboard flash. So there's quite a, you can store quite a bit of code in that, to be fair. Uh, I did say that I might talk about the uh, ESP32 as well. This is very similar to the uh, to the Pico. You pretty much multiply everything by two because um, it has twice as much and it has Wi-Fi as well. Just draw a bit more power though. Then for um, um, speed wise, so the Arduino is 16 megahertz. We were just talking about that at the beginning. If you remember the um, the BBC was what did we say that two megahertz was that. Um, so the Pico is 133, that's blazingly fast. Um, Microbit, the original one was 16, so similar to the Arduino, whereas the new one is 64 megahertz, so quite a bit faster. And then IO pins, so the actual pins that you can connect to, we talked about that being 19 on, on the Microbit, that's the same on the new version of the Microbit as well, they've not changed that. The Pico's got 26, so that wins there. And I think that also wins over the uh, the um, ESP32 or the ESP8266 that hasn't got quite as many pins um, I think it's 30 off the top of my head just have a quick look there see if there's a number of it I think it is 30 uh, and the Arduino has 14 so that's got the least number of pins that we can connect to and then from a Bluetooth perspective none of the mother chips have Bluetooth apart from the Microbit version 2 so that has a dedicated Bluetooth chip on it and you can connect it to like an iPad um, so you just Bluetooth connect to it and then you can actually load code and stuff over the Bluetooth. So it's pretty cool. And then speaker wise, the new version two has a little speaker on the back. It's this little chip just here. We'll have a look at that in a second. I'll have a listen to it. And it also has a microphone as well. Don't think any of us have a microphone built in. And then temperature sensor. This micro bit has got a bunch of sensors on it. So it does have a temperature sensor. 
but so does the Pico. So inside the core of the Pico is actually a little temperature sensor so it can detect the core temperature. So it can be quite a bit off to be fair. Um, I'm not sure if the micro bit, you know, how accurate that is, but it is actually a separate uh, chip discrete on the circuit board. So should be a, quite a bit more accurate, I would say. And then the accelerometer. So yes, the micro bits both have accelerometers on it. The new one has the compass as well. So it knows where magnetic north is. So that's really cool. And then the LEDs, so we've got these uh, LEDs on the, the front there. So it looks a bit strange because of the camera that I'm using. I could probably try adjusting the, is it the aperture of the camera? No, that's the focal length. Let me just try that back to there. So if I just wheel that round, there we go. You can see it looks like it's phasing in and out, which is strange. If you look behind me, if I just go to the full screen for a second, you watch the, these these LEDs here. If I change the um, the shutter speed on my camera, you'll see that the brightness is going up. But you'll also start to see the there's a sort of flickering effect going on just there. And that's because the LEDs are actually flicking on and off very quickly. It's more pronounced there. You can see like a... Um, sort of lines going across so I have to make sure that my camera um, is at a setting I think it's 320 was the optimum one where that doesn't become sort of a problem and doesn't look too noisy and it's the same when you're trying to sort of show people LEDs on a on a screen as well it looks like it's sort of phasing in and out whereas when I look at that it's a solid um, solid image but we can display all kinds of cool things on that LED we can do um, all kinds of things so let's get into that so what can the micro bit actually do? So it can do a surprising amount of stuff. So the first one is it can display little icons, little emoji type things. Uh, and I think on one of these, no, I've not got that running yet. We'll do that in a second. There's a whole library of um, like icons that people have built into the micro bits. There's like a duck, a cow, a heart, um, happy face, sad faces, yes and no. There's, there's loads of them. We can have a look and see um, what they are as well. So we can display images, we can scroll text. So one of the first things when you when you get a brand new micro bit and you plug it in, um, it has this little program that, that shows you everything that it can do. You can sort of do tilt sensing, you can press the A and B buttons, you can shout to it because it can hear you, it'll speak back um, and it'll display sort of scrolling text telling you what to do next. So that's pretty cool. It can detect light as well. Like I said before, I was really surprised about this. So those LEDs can actually detect the light falling on them and you can detect the light levels pretty pretty accurately it's got the temperature sensor built in uh, it has the accelerometer um, it has the compass as well so we can detect where magnetic north is these are going to be really cool for putting in our robot and getting it to understand you know is it facing 90 degrees from where it was before so with positioning this will be really really useful to us we talked about having bluetooth which is good for communication and this you know micro bit to micro bit communication so we could have a swarm of little smiles robots running around um, communicating to each other using uh, the micro bits radio interface that'd be quite cool it has a microphone built in um, it's a very small i think it's these little silver um, i can't really show you very easily on there let me see if i can find it first so it says microphone so I believe it's this sort of gold coloured, I just hold that there, just under my fingernail there's like a gold coloured rectangle, I believe that's the, uh, the microphone. And we also have the speaker as well, which is the, the great big square that's on there too. It's okay, the speaker, you can definitely hear the sounds, I'll play you some in a second and you can tell me what you think about those. It can play music, if it's got a speaker we can do notes, um, we did a, an episode on um, how to play music through um, the Arduino, just using like a buzzer um, a couple of weeks ago. So I'll, I'll make a note about that and put the link in the description of the video. So that's the uh, music. And then finally, the one that I was really impressed with, I was actually a bit blown away when I saw this. So it could do speech. How cool is that? So again, we did an episode just about speech. <laughs> the speech is a bit nuanced i would say i'm going to show you the uh the article that i found about this because um this did tickle me so let me just see if i can pull that up on the right screen there so this is uh the module the, the microbit speech module 
and it's based on something from 1982. So we're talking the era of the BBC Micro there. Um, so it's called Sam, the Software Automated Mouth, which I think is quite hilarious. And um, this was developed for the Commodore 64. Um, and yeah, it's, it's text to speech. It's good enough, the MicroPython team say. It's one of those that when you type a, a word in, so you, you simply just say import speech, speech.say, and then you give it something to say. And you'll hear that and you'll think, yeah, I can make that out. If somebody who doesn't know what this robot is going to say listens to that, they probably haven't got a clue what it's saying. It just sounds like noise. And that's more to do with how your brain processes um, speech. And they talk about this on here. Um, so what do they say? Um, the quality of the speech is not as previously stated amazing. It's quite usable though. And speech synthesis that's rough and ready is quite interesting in itself. Let's say you try this out and uh, using the example above, you'll not have any problems recognizing the phrase that you wrote um, and that you said out loud by the micro bit. So all excited, you write some hilarious funny joke or something rude and you play it to somebody else. And surprisingly, they don't seem to be able to make out what it said. And your first reaction is that you listen to it yourself. It sounds fine. The words are crystal clear and they can't, you know, they still can't capture every single word. So maybe um, you think there's something not right about their hearing and you'll be wrong about this. And it's more to do with how the way our brains process speech. And you've probably seen those things online where somebody has a... Um, you know, is the breast is the dress blue or is it gold and all that kind of stuff? And it's to do with how your brain processes information. And this speech thing is similar. So I actually did this um, just before the show, actually, and I was sort of saying, you know, what does this sound like? And Jenny was like, I have no idea what that says. And I was like, you can hear it. It says this. And it's it, again, it's because I wrote the thing and I know what I'm expecting it to say. So we'll do that in a second and we'll uh, we'll let you see what you think. <laughs> So there's a couple of differences between the version one and version two, and then we'll get into a demo very shortly. So version two was released last October, 2020, um, and it's got the extra Bluetooth 5.1, the low power version of Bluetooth. It's got the built-in speaker, it's got the microphone, the capacitive touch sensor. Um, it has a power saving mode as well, so it can be very low power and the processor is quite a lot faster. It's 64 megahertz that we saw before. Excuse me. Uh, the original one launched in March 2015, so this is quite an old chip. Uh, it did have the radio, the accelerometer, the temperature, the I.O. pins and the LEDs. So these things are still very usable, very good. They all run MicroPython and um, I think you can do like Java, Lua. There's all kinds of languages that you can run on these. Uh, they partnered with Microsoft. Um, and if you go to um, microbit.org and then um, is it called Make Code? There's an entire ID that Microsoft had developed, and you can tell because it's like really, really good. Um, so, a big fan of the Microbit now, um, having had a play with it uh, in, in a bit more in depth. And there are loads of add ons. We're going to have a look at these in, in a second. Um, there's like driver boards for motors, there's more development boards, there's um, robot kits. So, I bought a, a robot um, a, couple of, um, a couple of years ago, actually, uh, and this was. Uh, a kit from Kittronics. It's got quite a few servos on it and things like that. It's got batteries in there. If I sort of switch it on, you can see it's sort of scrolling some text just about. I think it just says hello world. Um, might not be able to see that though because of the way that the uh, the way that the, the lights are sort of phasing in and out. But um, yeah, there's a micro bit in there. There's a, another circuit with some batteries and you sort of just put all this and screw it together from just like acrylic plastic parts. Very expensive for what it was, I'll be honest. Um, it kind of looks a little bit like that vector thing, but um, not convinced. And there's loads of things y you need to solder the header pins on, and I haven't done that, so I've got loads of uh, servo. Oh, let's go to the main screen so we can see this. Um, so there's like a little truck behind there that has a servo in it as well. You can just see sat underneath. And um, what this can do is to sort of tip this back. Um, but again, you need to sort of hook everything up. Uh, to get this working. So that is a micro bit um, robot and it's got this little scoop thing and it has line sensors as well just at the bottom there. So there's uh, two line sensors like a left and a right. That way around is probably better left and right. And uh, yeah it can sort of keep between the lines and follow the lines. So there's quite a few different sensors. It has a bump sensor. You could either have the uh, um, this thing on or the bump sensor in front. And um, yeah, that's 
that's a micro bit robot for you we can use obviously these in smiles uh, i haven't done that yet but uh, that is definitely on my list of things to do and i've got the board that i can show you that we can use um, and there's loads of different providers who make these. So there's uh, Monk Makes, we'll get into that in a second. There's Pi Moroni, who sell Monk Make stuff. There is uh, Adafruit, there's Kittronics, which is what that's from. Um, and um, lots of other places as well that you'll find. So to upload the code, you can do this a different number of different ways. I use Thony because that works sort of very um, intuitively. Uh, the micro bit appears as a drive when you plug it in. You just see an extra drive on your machine and you can just drag files across to it. You can name them main and boot.py and it will always load them when it's just on battery power. Um, or when you just connect up the USB, you can just upload files through, um, you know, make code, thony, through an iPad, through a PC, through a Mac. Lots of different options. Cool. So mailbag. Let me show you what I got this last week. This is so cool. So um, through a mutual friend, um, Joe, Sot Joe Santarcangelo, um, he is a friend of mine from when I used to work in a school. And uh, he's got a friend called Simon. And uh, he said, oh, you should get in touch with Simon. Um, he, he, he does robots and stuff. And I get a lot of people saying things like that to me, that, oh, yeah, I know such and such a person. They do robots. Um, anyway... So um, I got in touch with Simon and he said, oh, I'll send you some bits and bobs and you can have a look at them on your show. So um, I didn't realize he has like an entire, you know, store of buying, you know, of, of, of stuff that he's made. So this is um, Monk Makes. If you go to monkmakes.com, I think that's the name of the website. Yep, yeah, monkmakes.com. Um, this is their sort of starter kit. And there's all kinds of things that you get in this kit. And there's a few extras that have been thrown in as well for me to look at. So... Um, we'll start off with some of the the main bits of this. So we've got like the the sensor board. So this has got on it um, uh, a microphone. And again, this is designed for the original micro bit that didn't have a microphone. We've got another temperature sensor, and we've got a, a light sensor as well. And what we do with these, we would just take our uh, crocodile clips and we just sort of connect them up like that. The temptation is to is to to grab them like that, but apparently you're supposed to grab them like that. Uh, it makes more of a um, a better connection so it's sort of grabbing it of a right angle rather than just sort of grabbing it like so so that's how you're supposed to do it and then um, it can also then connect onto another board as well if you wanted to and then you then use these other ones here to to connect to some pins so you can sort of grab the light sensor and on the back there there's a there's a, a url to the uh, micro bit sensor or you can just like take a picture of the uh, the code there to to get the, the link and then you plug them into your board and that you know you start playing with them so that's um the sensor board i like how how robust these are these are very well designed um all designed to be used with the, the crocodile clips these are primarily designed for education so you know bear that in mind when you're thinking about it Again, this is designed for the original micro bit that didn't have a speaker so there's a great big speaker there it's an mb underscore speaker uh, and you can connect that up as well and uh, listen to things with a bit more power we've got a relay board so i've got things like it came with the an le uh, sorry an old-fashioned incandescent bulb there and also a motor with like a little fan blade there as well so that we can uh, we can attach that to some battery and uh, got battery there that'll make that work maybe I need to do that hopefully I don't blow this thing up I think it's designed for it's designed for like quite low voltages but I'm just going to give it nine volts and see what happens um, there we go so there's a plus and a minus so if I just zap that on there yep that's a pretty effective fan that wow getting a bit of a shock then as I was doing that I could feel it pulling the current through it so yeah we can uh, plug that into our our robot um, this relay board is for sort of switching um, other different currents on and off we've got a great big uh, sort of regulator thing there to sort of protect it and um, we have one of these edge connectors so I was talking before about the you know the micro bit let me just grab my micro bit that's just over here and we can see that we've got all these different pins there, but really we can only grab hold of these these five pins there, which is two of them, one of them is voltage, one of them is ground. So plugging into this connector, 
means that we're able to um, to get access to the full range of pins and this breaks it out to an i squared c bus so it's you know it's got the right pins there selected and we've got the the other ones on the other side there for um i think it's sdi and spi sorry um so yeah there's a mb underscore connect for that one and it's also passing on those five uh, connectors as well so we could still have this in the way but get access to those those pins that we might want then we've got things like this um, uh, seven segment display i thought these were eight segment one two three four five six seven and then the eighth is the full stop or well, maybe i'm being picky there and we've got the little bit shifter in there as well for sort of registering things and um, that's under mb underscore seven underscore seg underscore seg for seven segment and uh, yeah that's loads of fun that one i uh, look forward to having a play with that uh, so we've done those ones and then we've got the slider so this is like a potentiometer and we can start from like a very low value there it's never quite zero when you register these things and you can slide all the way up to um, a high value in fact i did something similar like that um, with a pico so i've got a pico there and i've got a potentiometer and when i like turn that to the left there or when i move that to the right i can sort of see a range of values on the uh, um, on the terminal so it's very similar there we can have that as a sort of slider to make our robot maybe make that um, this uh, digger arm thing sort of move up and down by doing that as a sort of remote control thing a trimmer i like that i like the size of that that's uh, pretty robust and then you get with it a bunch of these um, crocodile clips so they're just about the right size for doing projects you don't want these too long but you don't want them too short either so there's two different sizes there that i've got so there are all the things from Monk Makes, and the, there's a, a battery connector as well. You can just uh, connect the, the different terminals to, um, just have like a 1.5 volt battery. Um, I would have thought you would need two of them, really, to get, to get the full amount, but it's enough to power something like this small fan, for example. We don't need a lot of power there. So yeah, they're all the things in the starter kit. And what I really liked about this, um, so again, I'll tell you, you know, I received this and I was like, oh, I'll have a look through this. I'll have a look through this and I'm quite a critical person. Um, and I was reading this, and I was thinking, bloody hell, this is very well written, um, like ridiculously well written. The, the language is at the right level for a student to read. It's very well laid out. The, you know, the pictures are all nice and crisp. Um, I like the way that they're all progressive. So your skills develop as you sort of go through the different um, projects that are in here. And there's a number of projects uh, in this kit as well. So I thought I'm, I'm going to check out who this guy is because, uh, you know, this is very well written. And then I looked and I thought, hang on a minute, I recognise the name Simon Monk because I'd bought this book um, a while ago and it's by the same guy. And sure enough, on the back, when you're looking at, um, you know, who this guy is, it says Monk Makes there. And there's the same starter kit, the, the starter kit that he sent me. We've got the battery, we've got the fan, we've got the light bulb, we've got the speaker, the crocodile clips, the sensor board. There it all is. <laughs> so I was like, I'm, I'm sure I've got more than one book from this guy. And yes, sure enough, this other book about the 30 projects for the uh, evil genius is also a Simon Monk book. So I was like, hang on a minute. You know, how many books has this guy written? So it turns out he's written absolutely loads of books. Um, so I'll have a quick look at his, uh, his website as well. And I've got to say, I'm not promoting this. Um, I've just been sent these things and I would review them. And I've got some other pieces here that we'll look at too. But I just wanted to very quickly just show you the uh, the website as well. So if I go to here and then I pull up uh, the browser again. Oops, maybe that one is better. And then I go to microbit monkmakes or monkmakes.com. And you can see there all the different things that um, you can buy. So there's lots of different resellers. Um, all around the world, depending where you are. There's probably one that's more local to you. Uh, and the products themselves, so if I go to products, the starter kit, there it is. Um, I'm sure there's more than that. There we go. So all these different things, you can buy the connector, the slider. There's an animatronic head, which looks really cool. We've got the relay, we've got the speaker, the sensor, an RGB LED. So you can do lots of different colors. We've got the seven segment display there. We've got the power module, a CO2 sensor. Um, there is the servo for micro bit, so you can plug servos directly into that. And then there's the servo kit, which is more designed for that. And uh, we've got some 
pack of uh, short LED uh, alligator leads as well. I call them crocodile leads. So yeah, um, quite a lot of stuff there to um, to sort of get you know get playing and, and, and learning stuff on that. You can learn that MicroPython at the same time as practically learning you know all these different sensors and what you can do with them. So that's uh, Monk makes and. Um, so I reached out to Simon, and um, I'll just come this way for a second. So I reached out to Simon, and uh, I, was, I said, "Oh, I didn't realise you were the Simon," <laughs> and he, he thought that was hilarious. Um, he said, "You made my day by saying that," but uh, I was a bit in awe, to be honest. And I was just checking him out. So I was speaking to him in a bit more in depth, and I said, "Would you like to come on the show uh, as a sort of interview? I've been meaning to do a new series of like Meet the Maker." Um, and I've got a few other guests potentially lined up too. So uh, Camilo from um, Auto DIY has expressed an interest, and so has Kevin Thomas, the original Smiles designer. So um, I'm going to see if I can line this up with Simon first. Um, I just need to write some interview questions for him first and have him, uh, you know, look through them first. But um, I thought this was quite a cool thing, just through a friend of a friend. Uh, I don't even know. I I knew people that knew people. <laughs> so. Other companies uh, as well. So this is a, an Adafruit um, Cricket, I think it's called. Um, and this is, yeah, there we go, Cricket. And um, this has got all kinds of things. So you've got a nice power jack there, and, um, a DC connector there. You've got the reset button. You've got a little slider for on and off there, so you can do that. There's uh, four connectors, uh, header pins for servos, so you can plug in four servos. You've got the... Um, it says drive there. I'm not sure what that's to do with, but um, uh, there's got a few edge connectors there. You've got some ground ones for the motors. We have um, some more a speaker one there. We have um, five volts ground for neo pixels. There's some capacitive touch, so when you touch these, it can detect the resistance. We've got the uh, connector there to um, um, for the USB, and finally on this side here we've got some uh, signal 3.3 and ground signal io pins there as well so it's quite robust it's huge i mean this wouldn't work well in a smiles robot for example it's just absolutely gigantic um but it, it does work you know you get your micro bit a bit like that edge connector there and you just shove it in it does tell you which orientation leds must be facing this way there we go and it sort of sits in there like so and um you know bob your uncle you can connect and uh, do everything you want on that so designed for a larger robot i would say a slightly smaller version and maybe more practical version is this one so this is from kittronic um i quite like a lot of their stuff that they did this robot as well this is a kittronic kit so similar with the uh the other one you have to have the leds facing that way and then on here what we've got just pull that so we can see it we have um We've got the power in that side there. We've got motor one, two, three, four, or motor one, motor two, input one, input two. And then on this side, we've got um, button B and button A, I think it says. So um, not sure what them buttons are for, but as a motor driver, that would work well for a Smars robot. So if I get a Smars robot there, it's a little bit larger, but only just. So I think we could probably pull out the motor driver board have this on there. It will be a funny angle, perhaps, because it's it's kind of it will be that way round. It is quite a maybe like a centimeter, just less than a centimeter wider. But I think we could make that work. I could have a little thing that slides in there, and this slides into that, and then we could have a little face on the front, and we can uh, get it to do various things. So that's on my to-do list of uh, projects of Fusion 316, and for the micro bit and Smars. Uh, other things I've got as well is um, so this is a Kittronics and it's called a Mi Power. So that's just a little coin cell. And what you do is you just screw these terminals in like so. And then if I just power that on, um, I don't know if just holding it there will be enough. Um, in fact, it's that way around, isn't it? Let's see if I can get this to actually work. Um, yeah, it would be that way. You, you kind of do it in front of it so that you can actually see the things, but um, I was just trying to get it to touch all of the connectors so they would come to life. Maybe the battery's flat. But yeah, it's a nice little battery pack. It's the right same same form factor as the, uh, the micro bit, so it's quite small when you've got it sort of wired in there. 
and then finally I've got this uh, another edge connector I think this is also a Kittronic yeah Kittronic and what this does is it gives you head pins so you can plug things in a bit like you do with um, the Arduinos the Picos and so on so edge connectors um, sorry header pins through the edge connector so that might be an option as well for the Smars but um, I'm more leading towards this one as maybe the, the way to go for the for the robot so lots of different connectors there I think I've shown you everything um, that I have for the micro bit and obviously it runs micro Python so we can have a play with that as well so that was the mailbag and it's demo time so let me see I've got um, a micro bit here plugged in and what I want to show you today I'm going to go out to uh, Thony. So if I just drag this up here, like so. Uh, in fact, if I go to that screen, is that better? I just drag that down there. Yeah, that's okay. We can see that fine. I'm just going to shrink the screen down a little bit. I think it's zoomed in a little bit. I just want you to be able to see the bottom of the screen. And there's Joe actually. So yes, this is Simon, the Simon Monk. You need to visit his shop. Um, you've got an idea for a customized board, he can build it. Awesome. So that's Joe just uh, chiming in there. Yeah, I didn't realize it was the Simon Monk. He has a PhD in computer science. So, you know, I'm very impressed with this guy. Okay, so um, what we'll do, I'm gonna head over to this view here so we can we can sort of see what's going on, kind of. And also we can we can do some code on here as well. Oops, just to drag this down a little bit. So what I'm going to do, um, you can see there the code's quite straightforward. Uh, I'm going to say import microbit, um, sorry, from microbit import star. And what that means is, as well as in, in loading in all the libraries, there might be some constants or functions or uh, pre pre-configured things like the, the duck and the cow image all those things are brought in by doing the import star because I was like why do that why not just say import micro bit uh, and that's the reason uh, we then import audio I didn't know that was a thing import speech that's that speech um, crude speech thing that we will look at in a second and import music so we can get it to play some things as well such as Nyan cat <laughs> so we'll do that in a second uh, so there's a little loop here that says well true display dot show and then in brackets image dot asleep so at the moment it's it's showing its image dot asleep and you can't really see that very well but there's essentially two eyes and a little mouth you can kind of see it sort of going between the two of them there I don't know if it's any better on the overhead actually it is better on the overhead isn't it yeah you can see that much better so I'm going to leave that on there so you can see it so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this code um, so it's now connecting to the chip. If I just move that up there, you can see in the... Uh, I just want to show you the bottom there. It says BBC Micro... Sorry, Microbit... MicroPython BBC Microbit there. If I click on that, we can we can specify which interpreter and which type of board it's using, which is quite cool. And this is just the regular Thony that we're all used to. And you've got the, um, the REPL down here. Read, execute, print and loop um, thing. And I've just clicked run, so it's now running this code. So what it's going to do is, if button A is pressed, then display image happy. So if I press A, which is that one, that's happy. Let me do it that way around. So I'm going to press that again. That's the little happy face. And it's also saying audio.play sound happy. I'm going to put this under the microphone so you can hear it a bit better. Hopefully you can hear that. And then the other one says, um, if button B is pressed, display image sad, audio dot play it sound dot sad. So that's the sad face. And then under the microphone. <laughs> and then finally, the one that I thought was really cool, if pin logo is touch display image surprise and then speech dot say hello YouTube so I'm going to touch that there and you can see it goes to that's apparently a surprise face I think it's supposed to be two eyes and a sort of mouth like kind of expression right so this is what it sounds like 
<laughs> it's not great, but it's not bad. So you can get it to say anything you like. So let's... Um... Let's just get it to say this. And I just need to do run. Uh, it'll go off for a second and then we know it's when it, when the image comes back on there, such as that, we know that it's uh, uploaded the code. So I'm going to press the touch again. Hello, Seaman Monk. Uh, we can <laughs> Let's get it to say hi, Joe. Oh, hello, Joe. Let's try that. I'm going to hit the run button again there, and then I'm going to press the capacitive touch. <laughs> it's cool because it's coming out of the thing and it's tiny, but it's not amazing speech. So if we want good speech, where's that board gone? So this is the Raspberry Pi Zero, and what I've got this on here is called a re-speaker. So it's a little hat that goes on, on the top there and the I.O. pins. And we can see there we've got all these different uh, connectors and that sounds very good it sounds like um you know, like a google home or a siri type voice or the, the other name that i can't mention because it's listening in on me at the moment in the corner that's good quality but you know you're paying 20 or 30 pounds for that this is built in that's really cool for nothing <laughs> for free so I'm quite impressed with that. I'm definitely going to write some things where this uh, talks. And it's got that kind of 80s vibe where it does sound like it's from the 80s. That's how a 1980s robot would sound. And I love the fact you just press that and it... <laughs> so I'm quite impressed with that. Let's have a look at some more code then. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go uh, full screen on that for a second, I think. Uh, oop, not that one. There we go. Uh, I'm just going to zoom out a bit as well because that's a bit too zoomed in, I think, for my liking. There we go. OK, so what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to write a bit more code because I want to show you what else this can do. So let me just stop that code from running just by pressing the stop button there. So this is the Thony IDE uh, and it's perfectly designed to work with the micro bit, both versions of the micro bit. So if I do that term um, from uh, micro bit import star, and then I do dir micro bit. We can have a look at what we've just brought in. Uh, what have I done wrong there? Let's do instead of doing that. Let's let's dir image for example. So here we can see all the different images. We've got chessboard, butterfly, asleep, duck, fabulous, ghost. <laughs> I mean, it says these things, but you know, ghost. Uh, it, it kind of does look like a ghost, rabbit, pitchfork, snake. So some of these things are worth having to play with, right? So let's let's try that. So I'm going to change the code on here so that it says instead of, um, let's see, can I get that to zoom in? I don't think I can, can I? Just trying to see if I could zoom it in any further so that you can see it a bit better. There we go, increase size. What's that? So shift, command and plus. Let's do that. Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, um, and that there is the thing itself. Let's get it the right way around. There we go. So while true, I'm just going to say display image. Let's try snake first of all. I'm just going to run that and let's see what that looks like just there. I mean, Kind of. Uh, let's try rabbit. Let's try that. So run. Yeah, I kind of see that as rabbit. I mean, you're not going to be able to do a high resolution graphic with 5x5, five five, but um, I guess it's better than nothing. So these are all um, predefined ones that somebody's put together. So one of the cool... There you go. I've got a few more now. Look, we've got... Um, happy duck ghost and then there's an image and what they've done on this one is you pass in the the sort of rows of uh, pixels and then you say what value between zero and nine you want them to be so you've got 10 different values so what do we think this is going to display so there's three 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 in a kind of diamond shape six 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 and another diamond and then in the middle we've got a nine so if i run this code it's going to cycle through those various different. Um, so there's the happy face, there's the duck, there's the ghost, and there's the star. So that's one that we've defined ourselves. 
and you can see there that the one in the middle is a lot brighter than the others so that's quite cool um, what else have we got on here so this one we're going to do um, while true display scroll temperature and then we're going to get it to sleep for uh, two seconds so this one is going to scroll the temperature so 21 um, according to my is it 21 I don't actually think it is 21 if I'm quite honest um, I've got an air conditioner and that says 16 degrees and I have a thermometer on my wall that says 15 degrees so I think that's a little bit off but maybe it's been under a hot light for a minute maybe drawing power making it say things has made it a bit warmer let's have a see if that's doing that again 21 it's pretty consistent to me 21 there um, what else is that we can get it to do so there was a there was a sound one wasn't there there was another sound one so what I'm getting there it is music dot nyan so instead of saying hi I'm just going to comment them out and we're going to get it so if I touch the logo it's going to play nyan right let's press play to uh, upload that so and it's just displaying the rabbit there so if I press the the, uh, the touch I'm going to put it under the uh, microphone It is Nyan Cat. Somebody's really wasted a lot of time <laughs> putting this in. But there's quite a few, so I'm going to get it to stop that now by pressing the little reset button. Oh, in fact, it's stopped now. I'm just going to leave that there. So if we want to see what other things... Oh, it's got music.nyan there. If we want to see what other things we can play there. So I'm going to hit stop so I can get back to the REPL. I'm going to go um, import music. And then I'm going to go DIR uh, music. Let's see if that will work. There we go. So we've got Baddy, Bad, or Badding, Birthday, Blues, Chase, Da Dum Da Dum, Entertainer, Funeral, Funk, Jump Down, Jump Up, and so on. <laughs> so I'm curious what some of these are. Uh, I'll try Baddy. So let's just go and change that to Baddy. Let's just press play and then I'm going to press the touch. How sinister. <laughs> and there's another one. There's some sounds that are quite cool. So if I just stop that and I do um, import sound. Is it sound or is it play? I don't think that's right, is it? Let's just stop that. So import audio. That's right. DIR capital sound. Um, what's wrong there? Da, 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 da. Sound isn't defined. I think what we might have to do is say from audio import star and then do DIR sound. Nope, not liking that. Sound dot. Let's just try DIR audio dot play. Um, I thought it was just that. I'll try audio dot sound. Let's try that. Nope. Oh, well, that's disappointing. Let me just try one last thing. So if I do print dir sound, no, nope, it's not having that, is it? I just wanted to know what some of the other options were. There is one that was uh, hello, so let's just try that. So where we've got audio.play sound hello. So I'm just going to stop that baddie. Let's upload that. Because this one, I think, is the best sound. They're going to go, hello. It does it twice for some reason, but I'm not sure why that is. So... It's quite a cool thing. I think there's quite a few cute things you could make this uh, do. So the fact it's got a little face, that's going to be quite useful. Um, we can get it to control some motor boards. That's quite cool. So um, plug that in there. Is it happy with that? Um, da -da -da -da. Yeah, so that's, that's the correct way around. So we should be able to drive some robots with that. Uh, and that's going to be one of my next little projects to do is um, what else can we do with this? We can bring in all that code that we've written in MicroPython to date. 
So one of the, the little notes I've got on here, somebody asked um, this week, when he, he said, where is machine? What was happening was he was just using regular Python and he was trying to load some code that says um, machine. So, you know, import machine. Machine is for MicroPython boards only. So if we have a microbit, we've got a, an ESP8266 or a, a Pico. These all have different capabilities. This has got a speaker and microphones and accelerometers and LEDs. This has got a temperature and an LED. This has got uh, Wi-Fi. All these are different capabilities. And the machine um, module in Python tells us what these things can do. So let's try plugging in a few different ones. So I've got this um, ESP, uh, oh, it's a Node MCU, I think it's called. So if I just plug this in here. So I'll plug that in there. Let's just put it over there. It's not gonna do anything because um, it's not connected up to anything else. Uh, but I can come into Thony and I can change the uh, thing that's connected there. And we can see it says MicroPython ESP8266. If I connect that there, and let me just see um, if it's gonna, it's having a bit of a, a moment here, I think. Let me just reload Thony. It's probably not a good idea to sort of change what you're doing midway through. There we go, CircuitPython generic. And what it's, what's it saying there? This is the board that I used before, isn't it? Before I start playing with it. Because I did flash uh, MicroPython onto this. So I'm going to stop that. Start. Right, there we go. Now it's not happy with that. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to reset it. Let's just unplug it and plug it back in. I was playing with this before. I did actually write a script that would um, connect to the local Wi-Fi and connect to the MQTT server that I run and it could send and receive messages. Um, so that was quite cool. Just a shame I can't get this working now. I wonder if I have to change that circuit Python thing back to that one. No, it's not happy with that at all. Oh, well, I'll show you the Pico instead then if that works instead. And then we can go back to the micro, micro bit. So let's just change that one to Pico. Yep, there we go. So if I do um, import, oops, import machine, and then I do dir machine, these are all the things that this particular micro bit can do, or this particular micro Python device can do. So we've got things like, um, uh, LED I think in there is one of the options so we can toggle the LED on or off um, and that's different to what the micro bit can do so if I unplug this and I plug in the micro bit and then I change which board that is connected to so let's just change that to micro bit <clears throat> let's see if it's gonna be happy with that no it's not happy with me doing that is it let's just restart that again it's because I'm, I'm doing this while it's uh, trying to connect to these things. Let's see if that's going to work this time. Let's just uh, quit and then restart. Because what's happening in the background, uh, it's connecting to the uh, the serial port and that's changing as we're, we're connecting to this. Well, that should work this time. Yeah, that should work. Oh well, I was, what I was trying to show you there is if you do DIR, um, let's just try opening up from the device. As soon as it's not connected to it, I don't expect that'll work, no. Uh, yeah, what I was trying to show you there is if you do a DIR machine after you've imported it on the different board, you'll see different options available. Um, and that answers the question that somebody asked me previously, which is why couldn't they see machine? They were using Python and not MicroPython. You can develop in Python and then bring that code into MicroPython most of the time, as long as it's not too extensive and it doesn't use specific libraries. Any libraries that you use in Python, you can use like pip to manage the library. With MicroPython, you have to import that onto the board itself to be able to use it. So um, it's a bit more involved. So that was one of the things um, I wanted to um, to talk about was the, the machine and the different boards. Uh, it's just a shame that Thonny sort of let me down a little bit there. 
Okay, so um, a couple of other things then. So um, Thomas just said there, it would be interesting if the compass worked in combination with the motor. Uh, I could never quite get that working right on the ESP32. Mm. So I'm very keen to, to sort of have a play with that and, uh, you know, see what that can do on um, with our robots from a positioning perspective. So I'm definitely going to design a little holder for that so that we can get it working with the SMARS robot. Definitely use one of these uh, boards. I'm going to see if there's a smaller one, but the micro bit is, is so wide. And I think that's about the width of the, the Arduino, uh, the SMARS robot as it is. So I'm going to have to have like a little thing that's sort of that sort of shape that this slides into and that slides into the SMARS on the top, a bit like we have on the version four. So yeah, that's definitely something I'm going to, to look at. Um, and what well, the other thing I was going to talk about as well was, um, so I do a video every Sunday. So um, I'm very consistent with that. <laughs> I spend all my weekends doing all this prep for you. So I hope you appreciate <laughs> all this effort. So you can see there we've got uh, Americas and Canada on the left hand side. We've got the European areas. Uh, we've got India, Pakistan and Russia. And on the right hand side we have Australia and China and again a bit of Russia. So um, every 7 p.m. GMT. That's going to change for me next week because we have... Um, British summertime. I know in the US they've already changed, um, was it last week, to summertime. Um, we have a similar kind of thing, so I'll, I'll, I'll say um, BST probably from next week, British summertime, because um, I still want to do it at seven o'clock my local time. So, but there's a video every Sunday. That's the main takeaway for that. Uh, if you've not checked out the website, then please go to smilesfan.com. Have a look at that website there. I've uh, started to increase and um, put more stuff around the Pico, um, not Pico Crab, because I've not done that yet, but uh, the, um, the Smars Mini is on there. So this little Smars Mini, uh, I've been um, working with... Um, is it, um, Laurent on that on uh, so he's actually put a, a, a remix version on Thingiverse so it's got the little holder for the back and a battery on there because quite a few people have asked how do you power this so there's a small battery that you can get for that and also the uh, so Pico Crab Smiles Mini and obviously Pico Cat that's the main one that we've been working on so I'm still working on that too check out smilesfan.com and the other one, of course, is if you want to help out the show, um, you can always buy me a coffee. If you go to buymeacoffee.com slash Kevin McAleer, you can uh, buy me a coffee. Uh, I, I am a coffee drinker. I do like uh, I do like my caffeine. It's my one vice. I do like Diet Coke and Diet Pepsi as well. But uh, yeah, if you want to help out the show, if you want to help pay for things like the website hosting, the royalty free music, the, uh, the graphics software. And um, was it Brian Moore who's asking what software I use to do all this? So I use Ecamm, Ecamm Live. Um, and Ecamm Live is um, it's about £30 a month to subscribe to, I think, for the pro version. So I have to continually pay that, even though I'm not getting any income from the show other than when people buy me coffees and stuff. So it really does help out uh, pay for some of that stuff. And it means we can carry on the show for another year or so. And uh, yeah, so that's the streaming software. Then I use things like Canva for doing the graphics. Um, that can help. I do have the full Adobe suite as well. And um, yeah, the equipment as well. So I've got a very expensive camera that I use. I've got a Sony um, uh, A6400. Uh, the lens on that is about the same price as a camera. That's about a £600 lens on that. So we get the nice uh, depth of field, the Boku, everybody likes there. And, um, and then there's all the expensive lights and overhead rigs and stuff. You wouldn't believe how much you have to pay just for a pole to hold things in place. So this overhead shot that I have, um, there's a pole that's holding this up. If I just tap this, you can see it wobble a tiny bit there. But that's pretty rock solid. And that's because um, I'm using um, a, an Elgato multi-mount. Uh, and I've got another multi-mount behind this big rig here. If, in fact, if I go to this view, you can kind of see some of the rig here. We've got the uh, the camera, they've got the microphones, that's the Elgato light. Got my, my monitors in front of me, this is just the GoPro. Um, we've got the microphone, the Blue Yeti Nano microphone that's on a, on a shock mount on a stand. And I've got some other sort of, um, that's called a hair light, which is quite ironic because I don't have very much hair. And uh, we've got another ring light there and the Elgato light. So it's quite a lot of stuff in here in general just to do the show, just to make it kind of look professional. I've got the stream deck there so I can switch between different views as well. And that's all connected to a, a great big, um, what's it called? Is it an Elgato? It is an Elgato Thunderbolt um, USB hub as well. I watch really expensive for what it is. It's just a USB hub, but it's a very, very fast one. 
So that means I can have all these different cameras plugged in and um, everything just works. <laughs> it just works. So yeah, if you want to help out, buy a coffee. Really appreciate that. Um, I appreciate every single person that's bought me one to date. Thank you very much for that. So yeah, and Conrad says, much appreciated. You're very welcome. You're very welcome indeed. Um, so I've talked about Meet the Maker, which is um, going to be a new little side series I'll do on this channel. Um, I'll try and get more people um, and maybe some makers as well. So you know, if you've got a robot that you've built and you want to sort of showcase that, let me know. Uh, I did reach out to James Bruton as well. Uh, he has a private YouTube channel as well as his main one. There's like a, a members only area. And he's going to do a video of other people that have done robots on um, and have submitted them. So I've submitted the uh, Pico Crab. So hopefully we'll get a bit of a shout out on uh, maybe something about smilesfan.com as well on there. So lots of cool things in the works there as well. Um, and yeah, talked about buy me a coffee. Got my post-it notes here. <laughs> All the things I need to talk about, remember, because there's so much going on. Um, cool. I hope that was really interesting for you. Um, if you've not like looked at, um, I'm not plugging this just because he's coming on the show, but if you've not looked at micro bits before, they are definitely worth uh, a look. Um, very capable as a little device, um, perfect for building little robots, lots of components and sensors and things built in, which is quite cool. So I'm definitely going to be uh, playing with these a bit more and uh, making a Smiles version, which I've always intended to do, just didn't have Fusion at the time. So now I've got Fusion, I can design that module, we can get it built, we can get it controlled, we can build our MicroPython code for Smiles and all those cool things that we can do with it. So really looking forward to, to doing that. So um, I think that's everything I've got for you today. I um, hope you enjoyed the show and I shall see you next time. Thanks everyone. I'll see you. Bye.